Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us all today. So today we have a very special guest. Not only is he a very distinguished researcher on the topic of implicit attitudes, he's also, I may say, a longtime friend. We've known each other since 2011 when both of our haircuts were a lot longer and we dressed, dressed much less professionally, but look at us now. So my guest today is Calvin Lai. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. So Calvin, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. All right, so today in class, we talked about these two contest studies that you ran about efforts to change implicit attitudes. I guess before we get into that, I usually like to start by asking my, my guests, what do you think are the research questions that most guide your work? Um, I think the, the idea that animates a lot of my research is um, this issue of biases that are hidden or implicit or subtle, right? The, the ways that um, people can um, discriminate without realizing or doing so in ways that are uh, not so obvious. And my particular interest within um, this class of hidden biases is figuring out what we can actually do about them, how we can uh, reduce the potential of discrimination in everyday life, uh, reduce the expression of these hidden biases so that perhaps we can live in a more kind of equitable society. Okay, so you probably just touched on this, but I'd like to ask all my guests, you know, based on what you just said, it's pretty obvious why we think this is an important topic, but in your own words, why do you think that these questions are so important? Uh, I, I think that uh, much of how we've thought about discrimination reduction over the past um, 50, 70 years has often been through this paradigm of the fact that there are these really bad, uh, blatantly racist people out there. And there definitely are those types of folks out there. Uh, but it, it seems that a lot of the character of, of how discrimination is experienced in everyday life comes in these more subtle forms. And so I think that there's... Uh, a lot of interest and a lot of importance to figuring out what we can actually do about these more subtler uh, micro level expressions of bias. Uh, okay, so you're, you're known for a lot of things, but uh, one thing a lot of people know you for is for these contest studies to reduce uh, bias in the implicit attitude measure, the IIT, which my class should know by now. And so this was kind of an unconventional approach, and I want to know what was the reason behind why you specifically took this challenge on to run a contest? Now, your answer cannot be because our advisor, Brian Nosek, told you to. Uh, how, no matter how true that is, but why do you think you in particular took that challenge? That's a good question. So I, as uh, a undergraduate, uh, I did my honors thesis on trying to change implicit biases, and, and I was really interested in, in these questions already. And one of the things that I came across in the literature is just that, wow, there are, I think at the time, literally hundreds of ways to change these implicit uh, prejudices or stereotypes. Um, but at the time, there wasn't any um, systematic effort to figure out, well, which of these efforts are, are, are going to be best? Which ones are going to be more scalable? Which ones are going to be the most applicable to real world settings? If uh, my grandma or, or a policymaker would come up to me and ask me, uh, which of these interventions to change implicit uh, bias is most effective, it would be really difficult to give them a straight answer. And so my thinking at the time was, well, what if instead of just kind of looking at these different interventions one at a time, we would put them all into one big super mega study, test them against each other and have them compete. And we can find what are the actual interventions that are really going to work um, best across uh, different populations and across different contexts. And, and are just going to work uh, most effectively uh, that are gonna have the biggest effects. Okay, so I mean, it's an unconventional paper for students who are used to seeing one, anywhere from one to maybe six authors on a piece of, on a piece of uh, work. But now there's, I know you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe 40 or so authors on each one of these contest studies? Uh, oh gosh, I don't remember the exact number. I think both of them are in their 20s, like 20 okay, to 20, 24. Right. Well, maybe combined 40 across the two of them, but yeah. so many names and it kind of changes the way that you approach um, how this work is done. What was the most surprising about trying to coordinate across all these researchers to tackle one question? Uh, I mean, I think that one of the, the revelations is just like, wow, academics are just like a bunch of cats. And <laughs> getting, wrangling them together to, to do something like this was like wrangling together a bunch of cats. Um, 
I think one of the things that was kind of trial by fire for me coming straight out of undergraduate and bossing around uh, some of these people that were professors and so on was just like um, learning how to manage large groups of people at once and how to uh, uh, communicate clearly, set uh, clear standards and deadlines and so on. Uh, so I think that was one of the, the kind of surprising parts about putting this type of collaboration together. Uh, everyone had their different ideas and, and we had to do a lot of uh, consensus building for how to make interventions that would be comparable to each other. Because mm -hmm. you can't have one person over there saying, I want a one hour long intervention and the other one over here saying, I'm just going to have like a two minute blurb. You need something to kind of make them apples to apples comparisons. I see. So the first content study that you ran did a nice job of pitting many different approaches against each other and to find out what works. And in lecture, we're going to go into much more detail about what worked. I guess I want to focus a little bit more on the second contest study where you took what worked and then you see you saw, well, how long are the effects for uh, these, in, these manipulations? And what you found in a nice instance of replication is that immediately they still seem to work uh, from following up from the first contest study. But after a minimum of 24 hours, those effects didn't persist for the most part. I think there's one exception there. Uh, so first off, were you surprised by these findings at all? If you had to predict when you're first setting off the study, you've wrangled all the cats, you're just about to press launch, what did you think was going to happen? Uh, it, it, honestly, I think that with hindsight, our results like seem obvious, but at the time they really were not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, I was probably kind of 50-50 about whether we, we'd see something. Uh, one of the things that... Um, was a deliberate design decision was not to look long term over several weeks. We deliberately said, let's just look a day or a couple days Barely. because we, we were already not so optimistic that these effects would persist, right? Uh, we're giving people about five minutes of experience and we're trying to undo uh, a lifetime of associations and experience, you know, other types of experiences that people have built up. Um, but I, I think at the time and, and to some day, you can still see some of the strands in the research literature. There's this like competing, there's kind of two competing ways of thinking about what implicit bias change ought to be like. There's one model of which you think of it as um, something like persuasion, right? Where if you just give someone the right experience, that's gonna set off a kind of click in the back of their heads and, and it's gonna change them in a, in a really powerful way. Just as a really strong argument might change your mind in a permanent way. Uh, but I think there's a, a kind of second strand in the literature that often thinks of these implicit biases, these implicit attitudes as something that's more like changing a really difficult habit, right? Something that's not necessarily gonna happen overnight, that's gonna take a lot of sustained effort and, and repeated experience. And I think what we ended up finding is more evidence for that latter account, that changing these implicit biases uh, isn't so easy to do uh, in, in a durable way um, with just a five minute experience. And, and studies outside of my own have have really kind of hammered down that like if you want to change these things, the types of experiences that you need are going to be at a scale that um, are are quite difficult to achieve in everyday life, right? Things like um, being randomly assigned to having a roommate of another race for an entire semester, right. or having a professor that is uh, of a different social group than you. So has this changed your approach to the value of studying change in implicit attitudes? Do you still pursue this question in your own work, given how hard you found it to be? Uh, it's definitely changed my approach to thinking about the issues um, in, in two ways that, uh, two different ways. So uh, one way that I've thought about it is that, you know, outside of the work that I had been doing, I was aware of all this other research showing that if you, change the structure of how people make decisions or, or you do interventions that are much more kind of behaviorally focused on, on troubleshooting a specific behavior, those ones seem to be much more effective at discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so what I saw this, after I got these results, I, I kind of thought, well, this is, if not a dead end, a, a really hard end to get out of in terms of figuring out how to reduce discrimination through reducing implicit bias. So maybe if we're thinking about reducing these subtle instances of discrimination, uh, focusing on other sets of strategies, working around the implicit biases instead of reducing them directly will be more effective. And so part of my research in the years since have, has focused on working around the implicit biases that we have instead of trying to reduce them 
uh, deep down in some way. Okay. Um, an another way that I've thought about it, uh, which I'm quite persuaded by, is that um, perhaps we were too optimistic about what it takes and what is required of us to change our implicit biases, right? Um, just having five minutes, an hour, a couple hours is a lot to ask of any educational experience. Um, and perhaps we should be treating it like uh, we treat, you know, building uh, calculus skills or learning about US history where we have a whole semester of experiences so that these things can be become deeply internalized, right? We have this model that it's something that we can fix um, in just a couple of experiences, but perhaps the solutions are ones that are going to require much more chronic experience over longer periods of time, right? Some of that might involve just simply changing uh, uh, where you live or what types of media that you regularly consume and so on, not just one, one piece of media. So are you, I think that's right. I think maybe we'll have to change the everyday experiences that shape these associations. And then through that repeated exposure to different types of information, maybe these implicit biases will change. I guess, are you optimistic about these types of changes in people's lives happening naturally over time that we're seeing an increase in these types of experiences people have that might actually change these implicit associations? Uh, I am I am optimistic. Um, and I think that there's some great evidence uh, from our research website, Project Implicit, that suggests that some of these things may be happening at the cultural level. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, reductions in uh, anti-gay prejudice, uh, implicit and explicit, have declined precipitously over uh, the past decade, decade and a half. Decade and a half. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think some of the recent estimates suggested, at least implicitly, is around 24 to 25%, and, and it's probably happened more uh, since the last estimate in around 2016. Uh, same for uh, reductions in implicit uh, racial prejudice, where um, there were declines that were kind of linked to the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that um, these changes are happening in the real world. They're really difficult to capture uh, in laboratory settings, but um, something is changing. It's not like these things are just totally locked in. Um, I think they these implicit biases these often, at least correlation, they seem like they're reflections of the culture around us. And I think that's, that's what we see when we look at these data at scale. So just for you to be, just to be concrete, explicit about this, this question, you attribute mostly, we can't really know this from the data, but the changes in, for example, uh, implicit biases about sexual orientation to maybe people having more personal relationships with people who are lesbian or gay or representation in the media. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah, to clarify, it's, that's exactly right. I think that there are, for many people, tens, hundreds, thousands of these experiences that accumulate over years from seeing stuff in fictional media, hearing things in the news, hearing about a friend or a friend uh, who is uh, gay or lesbian, all of these things can kind of add up over time. And these, sh these shifts in um, uh, what's kind of socially normal, I think, ha has these long-term effects. So I'll end with this question that I like to ask all the guests is, thinking within your field, what are the questions that you most hope that this field answers or looks into or at least makes progress on in the next five to 10 years? There's certain questions that keep you up at night that make you wanna say, I should really get into this or someone should really get into this and I hope we know more 10 years down the road. Yeah, I, I think that, um, and to me, this feels like a personal hobby horse, but uh, that, you know, we, we have spent now uh, uh, over 20 years, uh, some might say over 30 years, studying these phenomena, these implicit biases. And I think we, we know a lot about the basics of how they operate. Um, and I think there are still kind of ongoing theoretical questions about um, exactly what they are like. But I think that we actually know a lot that is relevant for actual action, for actual intervention, um, um, particularly intervention in the real world. And so where I'm really hopeful that uh, more researchers will dive into is 
uh, testing ways to address these biases, uh, not just in, in lab settings, but also uh, you know, in police departments, in uh, uh, organizations and companies. So we can find what actually works or not to address uh, subtle cases of discrimination. I think we, we know so much about how they work. We don't know so much about what we can do about them that's going to be consistently effective. Okay. Well, we look forward to you doing that work and maybe viewers of this video doing that work in the years to come. But Calvin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Great. Pleasure to be here.